this is Rocky Hall, Lassen County Oath Keepers, Susanville, California, giving my story. If I don't like what I say, I'm probably not going to upload this. But I am on my way home. Uh, I am tired. Uh, 18 days of a little high stress makes one a little weary, especially at my age. And I want to apologize for the rants that I've had in the last couple days, but uh, I'm kind of getting a little fed up with some things, and uh, I do apologize if I cussed and made anybody feel uncomfortable or whatever. But uh, I'm showing the front here because I want to show you guys the, the terrain and what we're fighting for. This is our country. This is it. This is it. On the road. Uh, 395 heading into California, and in case I get pulled over, I'm going to uh, have things visible, which is my invest blah, my interview package that I used at work sometimes and the such, my Oath Keepers thing, and I've got my Sheriff Mac book up here, and he signed it for me last night. He signed it for me last night at the uh, meeting. So I guess I I've thought about this, and what am I going to say? The first day that I got into Burns, Oregon, I kind of hit the pavement running, literally. I was there for maybe a couple hours and was assigned to numerous job duties. And then uh, Sergeant Major says, we've got intel, we've got information as to there was a shooting, maybe possible death. I need you to go to the hospital and verify this. And we'd already heard that the hospital had been on lockdown. So I took my badge, I took my retired state ID and uh, another person that was in our group of female because you know as females are you know we're used for that kind of stuff because we're just so non-threatening and so I went to the hospital that night uh, it was dark the hospital was absolutely 100% on lockdown the military that I saw their military sheriffs local PD I assumed they were uh, all long arms, all heavily armed, all he uh, everybody had body armor on, and so I walk up like I own the place because that's what I do because I'm just a tad bit uh, ornery, and asked to know if anybody there I could speak to that was a supervisor. I handed them my state ID, showed them my badge, and was kind of poo butted. And finally a sergeant came out, I handed him my state ID and started to show him my badge and he just kind of just glanced at it, poo butted me and, all I, and I just, I kept telling him I'm, you know, retired law enforcement, I would like very much to know if you have one of our guys in this hospital, please let us know. And that's all we want to know, is he okay, are they okay? And they wouldn't tell us anything, nothing, and they asked us to step back, told us to kind of go away, and me, I write, I read body language, and I would say out of that bunch, maybe 10 that I saw, at that door alone, the emergency entrance, uh, two were comfortable with what they were doing and knew what they were doing, I would say, and the, uh, the others were really out of their element. A uh, female that I saw there was really totally out of her element. I don't even think she had her gun strapped on right. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm not being sexist or anything, but uh, it is what it is. I see what I see, and blah, blah, blah. I heard, overheard two of them talking that they were preparing for an active shooter, which I just thought was total BS, because none of us, none of us were even talking about something like that. I mean, why would you go into a hospital? Seriously? I don't know. It's not in my brain cells, so... That kind of irritated me. I thought, what a moron, even to believe that. But anyway, young kids. Moving on, uh, I saw one of the hospital employees go to the parking lot, and so I kind of scooted off and found that person and asked them if we had one of ours in there. And at that time, she told me there was one person in there, uh, non-life-threatening injuries, and there was no fatalities, which we proved later to be false, as Mr. Finnegan had been murdered. And so I went, I thanked them, of course, for, you know, giving us what they could, and 
she did her best. I don't think she was lying. I think that she told us what she thought to believe was the truth. Your tax dollars at work. <laughs> Shit. Uh, I went back, I informed my sergeant major as to what had transpired at the hospital and everything that I saw, intel that I gathered, and we were standing by to stand by to stand by, and um, several hours later we got a call that there had been a young lady dropped off in the Safeway parking lot that had been involved in the situation. And so uh, we jumped in our vehicles, Sergeant Major and myself, and drove to a person's house that uh, had received the call and we gathered forces and went down to Safeway. And it turned out to be Victoria Sharp that was there. And uh, I have a cow in the middle of the road. Okay, don't hit the cow in the middle of the road. Hey, this is, this is the Wild West here, folks. So it proved to be Victoria Sharp, and what had happened was that she had been in the vehicle with Lavoie at the time of the shooting, and uh, don't hit the cow in the road. Obviously, they, they blew a crap ton of holes in the vehicle and everything else. She was taken out of the vehicle. She was searched by a male officer. She was cuffed and stuffed, and several hours later, I, I assume, was told that she was taken down to the substation and questioned for however long, and she kept asking them if she was under arrest, and they would never tell her that she was under arrest. And this is first-hand knowledge because I spoke to her. And she was there for a long time, and she refused to talk to them because this little girl is just tough as nails. And she says, I want to, finally she just said, I want a lawyer. And if I'm under arrest, then you need to arrest me, and I want to go home. And so they took her and dropped her off in the Safeway parking lot, 15 degrees, folks. I know, because I look at that stuff and I get cold. Dropped her off in the Safeway parking lot, 15 degree weather. She knows nobody in Burns. She has no friends, no family, and she has no money at this point because they kept her purse. The lady in Safeway, the checker in Safeway, saw this young scared girl out in her parking lot, went out there and, hey, are you okay? And obviously Victoria broke down. She snatches her up, brings her in Safeway, brings her into the back office and, uh, you know, gets her something to drink. And then she made a call. And the person that she made a call to made a call to us. We gathered forces, we got down there, and I'm going to tell you guys that my mama bear kicked in, and all I wanted to do was wrap my arms around this girl that I didn't know from Adam and just protect her with my life. I, I just cried. The checker was crying, I was crying, Sergeant Major had some tears welling up there. I'm going to tell you, he'll deny it, but it, I saw what I saw. The lady that was with us cried. It was, that, Victoria was shaken. She was traumatized, she was scared. And so we grabbed her up, snatched her up, got her to a safe house. We got her to a safe house and I turned to my Sergeant Major and I said, sir, permission to interview her before we gotta get her word, we have gotta get her statement, we have gotta get what she saw because I know for a fact that she can come up missing. Please give me permission to interview her. And he did, of course he did, because he's an awesome guy. And so we sat down in that living room and I interviewed her approximately 15 minutes and that interview was sent out. And that is not the interview, not the interview that's on the internet. It, uh, my interview with her has not been released. It is safe. So I talked to her and I asked her to explain from A to B what happened. From the moment she got in the car, why she was in the car, who was in the car with her, exactly where they were sitting in, in relation to where her vehicle was in the relation to the other vehicles in the convoy. There was a total of four cars, I do believe at this time, that were in the convoy. Two ahead of them, her car being the third with Mr. Lavoy, and the fourth car being Mr. Bundy, uh, Mark McConnell, and the others that were in his vehicle. She, she told me 
she told me absolutely everything and the, the interviews that are on the internet and on television at this time are almost verbatim what she said. My upper management asked me, do you believe her? Absolutely I believe her, but due to her age, traumatic experience and her, and her, uh, the, the trauma involved in the situation, her numbers are going, her numbers and, and ability to uh, gauge time would be askew because of her training, age, and the traumatic event that appeared, that happened to her. And so I, I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt her story and as she saw it. And that's what all I want to say about that. So we handed her off to somebody that took her out of state and got her safe. And then we went back to our place of residence at the time. And then we got another call. I, I don't know how long later it was, but we got another call that there was somebody else that had been dropped off in the Safeway parking lot and was without transportation or a place to go. And it, it, at this point, we became a refuge. This is, I do believe, when we became the re refuge. <laughs> We got to the Safeway parking lot and I asked the checker, the same checker, I said, uh, you know, has anybody been dropped off? And she pointed to somebody in the parking lot, which turned out to be uh, Mark McConnell. We picked him up, we introduced ourselves. They did release him with money, but he said when they released him that they per the, the, the cop that dropped him off said, good luck finding a room and he said that he called around and there were no rooms and it was cold that night it was cold so he was just in a jacket his the clothes he was wearing and nowhere to stay and so we took him in and at that time i again asked permission to do an interview with mark mcconnell i took him in the back room and i interviewed him for approximately 15 minutes and the story that he put on the internet is really close to what he said to me at that time. And there is the question as to whether he is an informant. I do not know that. I cannot verify that. I do not have proof of that in any way, shape, or form. I am going to say that he justified the shooting far too fast for not even being able to see it and I, that bothers me and I'm gonna say that out loud he I asked him in in relation to the other vehicle that mr. Lavoie was in could you see what happened no he could not and so he told me that he got his information uh, from miss Cox because she was in the vehicle and that he got put into the paddy wagon with her and that is what she stated to him and then she has called him a bold-faced liar so anyway that's all i know that's secondhand information he said what he said she said what he said blah 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 and uh, so i get about an hour's sleep uh everybody's kind of little on edge you would as you would imagine our stress level is pretty high. I think I slept for an hour. I got woke up by Sergeant Major. Two kids in the refuge wanted out. And it was 2 in the morning. They called 911. 911 dispatched them through to the crisis line. The crisis line dispatched them through to the FBI. The FBI dispatched them through to us, uh, which would be Sergeant Major. I was asleep. And so they drove an ATV out that night from the refuge to the Narrows in the middle of the night. He picks them up at 2 a.m. at the Narrows, gets them warmed up because, again, I'm going to tell you guys, it's cold, and brings them in, radios me, put on the, put on the coffee, makes something hot, hot chocolate, hot coffee. We get them in there, we warm them up, and they are... Uh, distraught, they're they're uh, in mourning because of they heard, what have what they heard happened to Mr. Lavoy, and they had got to know Mr. Lavoy very well, uh, Lavoy Finnegan, and they were very upset. Uh, 
the next morning, I again tried to go to sleep. The next morning, uh, things got to the point where the, the that young couple needed to go home. And so I loaded them up in my car, drove them all the way to Pendleton, Oregon, approximately four plus miles, four, four plus hours, I don't know. It was the longest four hours of my life, I swear to you. I was seeing gremlins, I was so tired. There was gremlins in the road. I got up there, I checked into, I, I handed them off to some awesome 3% and they were safe. I knew they were safe. That's all that mattered to me. And three percenters got them uh, fed and clothed and, and took them in and, and gave them a place to sleep that night and then got them on a train the next day. And then they were sent home to Washington somewhere. And so I was too tired to drive back to Burns. I checked into a motel, no toothbrush, no clean clothes. Didn't matter, I wanted a pillow. I slept, I got up the next day, drove back to Burns, and Sergeant Major had picked up another young man, no, that's not true, I don't know if it was that day or the next day, they're kind of all running together, so I think it was that day that there was a father that was blowing up Sergeant Major's phone his son was in the refuge and he wanted him out a concerned father I want my son and so sergeant major I do believe stayed up for like 30 plus hours straight calling and calling and calling long story short we got the young man out sergeant major got him out I did not help in that I helped when the kid got to us and the refuge as we're calling it at this point our refuge and so that was Oath Keepers deal in this. We were there as a buffer. We were there as uh, support. And so this young man was brought to us and he was so tired and so stressed out. He slept for two solid days. Got up and ate. I think he might've taken a shower. Uh, eat, bathroom, back to bed. He slept for two solid days. His family finally arrived and the stress on their face was unbelievable. I think the brother was ready to knock me over to get to him. He just looked so distraught. And the dad, I gave him a big hug and he teared up and we all teared up and it, it just handed him over to his family was all I wanted to do. That was it, that, 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 that's, all, that's all that mattered. And I can tell you that two solid days I didn't let that young man out of my sight. It had been hell or high water to get to him because you'd had to go through me. And it just didn't matter. I just, I, I, I didn't know this young man. I don't know why he was there. I don't care. I don't care. I just cared to get him back to his family in one piece. That's, that, that's it. That's all I wanted to do. And I did. And it helps me because it just feels a little bit better, you know. So... After that, what did we do? Oh dear, uh, just a lot of calls. Sergeant Major, a lot of calls into the refuge, trying to talk people out, just trying to get them out. And that was our job, you know, just to uh, try to keep the peace. Come Monday was the protest at the courthouse. And that's when uh, I started recording things as well. And somebody asked me why I got this camera. And it was because of Victoria. It was because of her. I just knew her story had to be told. It had to be safe. Mark McConnell's story, whether one side or the other, it just had to be said. And then I started talking to the locals and the concern, the fear in their eyes. What are we gonna do when you guys go home? What are we gonna do? Where are we get, what, what's gonna happen to us? And I thought, I gotta get their story. And Wayne Hansen went all over town looking for this camera that I'm using right now, and it was found at the local pawn shop. I think it was his last stop. 
okay, fine. That we'll we'll take it. We'll take it. We'll take whatever we can take. We'll we'll deal do and I think the universe gave me this camera for a reason because I got some really good interviews really good interviews and I apologize for putting my two cents worth in on some of those but I'm just frustrated guys that you know it is what it is and uh, I, I did several interviews at the protest there on the courthouse steps and I think that they were really good. Uh, the, the quality of this camera is just, obviously it's just not the best. Hey, pitch in, buy me a new camera, send me a new camera, guys. And a, a better mic, a better mic would be great. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, I'm really tired, and so I really, I, I, the, the days and the dates and the times, I would do an absolutely horrible report if I had to sit down and write it right now and I'm tired it's my granddaughter's birthday today and she's a beautiful little gremlin and I'm going home I'm gonna see her before it's midnight and just hug her you know and pet my dog and hug my daughter and kick my son-in-law in the shin because it just makes me happy but I, uh, the other stuff that's transpired I never went out to the Narrows until several days ago we were so busy in town that I just didn't do it and then we went out there and I interviewed the owner and then a local rancher walks in and she starts talking and I asked her if she would do an interview and she did uh, and it was literally spur of the moment, off the hip, from the gut. Both of them uh, gave really good interviews. Uh, just I try to make people feel comfortable. Uh, I'm nobody. I'm nobody with a cheap camera from a pawn shop. But if that's what you can do, then come on, guys. Come out here. Help us because I'm going home with my little cheap camera and I don't know who's gonna pick up the reins. And I couldn't, oh, let's talk about that. Uh, internet service. The day they went out there to take over the refuge, the FBI, the military, whoever it was, because yeah, blah, blah, blah. Internet went down. They have hacked my phone. They have hacked my partner's phone. They have hacked my other partner's phone. Uh, I had plenty of leeway on my credit card. It was declined. I called, got it reactivated, uh, got it paid up to date. I got money on the books, you know, hey. Uh, I've had several other people tell me that one, when they tried to use their debit cards, credit cards, uh, D, uh, the uh, food stamp card, whatever it's called, they tried to use that. Everything's been whacked, hacked, looked at, scribbled on, moved around. And maybe that's why I have this cheap camera. I, can't, I guess they can't tap into it unless it... So... We're doing what we're doing. And the amount of uh, donations and stuff that have come in and gone to the motel and paid for our rooms, it's a big, huge help. Huge help. I can't say enough. And cameras on light poles, telephone poles, in this very small town of Burns. Burns and Hines are one town, that, two towns that grew together in one. And the income and the revenue from the locals is very low. And the dollar amount that has been spent here with the military, police, sheriffs, adjoining counties, and the surveillance that's been put on these telephone poles and these stoplights. And I do believe I have those pictures that I have not uploaded yet. I couldn't, we got internet service for a minute because I went through a back door. And so I uploaded two interviews, and that's the two interviews that you got. I interviewed, uh, 
there, the one that was put on there today, Saturday the 13th, was the second half of the interview, and I couldn't get the first half to load because my internet was taken down. I don't know if that's, a, you know, a fluke. I don't know if somebody did it, but we are having some problems. If Anonymous out there can help us, hey, step up, my friends. You guys are awesome. I love you guys, truly. You have uh, probably saved my life because when I was down at the Bundy, they took down our internet as well, and it was Anonymous that got it back up, and we could send our photos and, and videos and the such out. So um, I love you guys, man. Seriously, you get some good kids out there. And I don't mean to call you kids, but whatever. Uh, I got that mother complex going on, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's getting dark. I don't know how much more this video is going to take, but my battery only seems to last an hour, which is kind of awesome. Uh, I don't know what else to say. I'm happy to be going home. Uh, I'm really sad for the people of Burns because they have to stay. They're the ones going to stay and pick up the pieces. They're the ones that are going to stay and fight. Uh, send them your prayers. Send them some encouragement. Send them a card. I don't know. You know? Uh, shoot. What to do? What to do? Be, do your best. Do what you can. It starts in your community as well. It starts with your local elected officials. Your sheriff. How good is your sheriff? Is he a constitutional sheriff? Listening to, to uh, Sheriff Mack last night always gets me riled. Always gets me pumped up and gets the energy flowing and gets you going again, you know, and, and uh, that's a huge help. Yeah. Uh, if I've made a difference, I don't know. I don't put my face on camera because... Uh, it's not about me. It's about the people of Burns. It's about the people in Bunkerville, Nevada. It's about the Hammonds. It's about the Bundys. It's about Lavoie's family and the grief, the grief, the grief they're going through. I mean, it's, nobody can understand that unless you've been through it. If you've been through losing somebody that close, you'll understand. And uh, I think he was murdered. I honestly believe he was murdered. And my video, my Facebook, I can say what I want. Uh, am I being looked at? Yes. Oh. I got, at 1,600 hours, I got confirmation that I do not have an arrest warrant out for me, let's say, at this time. So, that was a big relief, because now I'm free to travel. And travel is what I would want to do now that I'm retired. Travel is what I've wanted to do for a long time. I have worked all my life. I've been living on my own since I was 16 years old. Everything that I have, I've worked for, paid for myself, by myself, and I'm tired. I, I, I would like to travel. And these Patriot vacations, I mean, they're, they're, you know, you get to travel and stuff, and you get good Patriot food, but, uh, you know, a warm sandy beach is not a bad idea either. <laughs> Next time, can we do it uh, uh, somewhere warmer? And hey, we might get that opportunity because, because things are happening in Oklahoma. The things are happening with BLM in Texas. Please don't make me go to Texas in the summertime. I don't want to do that. Uh, yes, I will. Yeah, I will. I'll just put a big, huge air conditioner around my car or something. And I'll go. I'll go. Meet me there. Let's have lunch. Let's do coffee. Okay, now I'm rambling. I was born and raised in Humboldt County, California. And I was raised around a lot of uh, hippies, Vietnam vets, bikers. 
and I love those guys. They taught me to, to question my government and love my country. And nice girls don't have tattoos. So I never got a tattoo. I don't have any tattoos. I like my Harley. I do ride my Harley when the weather's good and I don't freeze. Um, I have awesome friends over there. They have been very supportive of me and kind if they're not supportive, they've been kind. <laughs> and that helps. It helps. And the financial help that I've gotten from friends as well has, has helped a lot. Uh, I, I keep all my receipts, so if you want to see them, you know, gas, food. Uh, I miss my friends in Humboldt, guys. I miss my family in Humboldt County. And I love you guys very much. Yeah, I do. Yeah, my kids over there. I got kids over there. I do. Uh, nieces, nephews, and such. Cousins. Brothers, sisters, family. Extended family. Uh, I'm rambling. I'm tired. Four more hours. Four more hours. I can do it. I've got 2,129 miles on this trip right now. I'm looking at it. 40,000 miles. Almost 41,000 miles on this car since uh, two years. In two years. Uh, first got it. Went to the Bundy. Went to the Sugar Pine. Uh, Vegas. Vegas was a fun trip. Thank you. And... I don't know. Patriots, step up. Step up, guys. Come on. I don't know what to tell you that'll make you help. Help! Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed the scenery. I hope it wasn't too uh, wiggly to make people nauseous. I watch people's cameras that do that and it makes me nauseous. I don't know what to say, guys. Um, if there's anything that you want to know, just send me a private message, and I'll try. I'm doing what I can do. That's all I can do. This is Rocky Hall signing out. Thanks. If there's anything else, I'll come back. I don't know. I don't know. I hope this turns out. <laughs>